God, and we've been answering some of kind of life's biggest questions and questions about God, and it's been really helpful, especially um, going to the Bible studies, going to small groups. So have you guys enjoyed this uh, series so far? Yeah. yeah okay. All right, good. Sam, thank you, one of you. Um, uh, sorry, everybody else. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but, uh, but we've been going through these, and we've been asking these big questions and answering them. And today we're asking the question, is the Bible reliable? Is the Bible reliable? Or another way of putting that is, can we actually trust what the Bible says? Can we trust the Bible is truth? Now, here's the thing. For me, this topic is one of my favorites. And it's because of something that happened to me a few years back. So in 2014, um, I was working on a boat and I was way up high. We were like 40 foot off the ground. And I was working with a coworker named Ryan. And we were buffing and waxing this boat. And Ryan, just to kind of tell you a little bit about him, he's somebody that hated Christianity. Anytime you had any chance to say anything negative or point out some flaw or whatever else it was, make fun of me, whatever it was, he was going to do it. So I'm up on top of this boat, and I'm buffing and waxing this boat with Ryan. So we get into the conversation about the Bible and where we get the Bible, where does it come from and things. And he said, dude, I'm not going to believe the Bible. That was just written by like 10 guys or something that got in a room somewhere, wrote it just so they can control people. And I was like, bro, really? You That's what you believe? You believe you're just like a few guys that got together and wrote the Bible just so they can use it as like control over other people? He's like, yeah. And I was like, dude, that's not true. You have all of these other people that wrote it and things like that. And he asked me this question, though. After I went in and told him like, oh, yeah, you have different biblical authors and things like that. He said, how do you know that? And then I was like, it's a good question because I didn't have an answer. I didn't have an answer to like, wait. I don't, besides just faith, besides just my faith and I believe the Bible to be true, besides that, I didn't have any other evidences of where we got the Bible from. You know, for all, both of us knew, he and I had the same amount of actual truth, actual facts backing up our claims. His claim that there's just 10 people in a room that wrote it together, that could have been true, right? Compared to my, my idea that it was written by a bunch of different authors over different times. Because I had no other facts to back it up besides my own faith. And so what that did is it sent me on like a two-year journey where I just started digging in and started consuming everything I could about where the Bible came from. I started reading books about manuscript evidence and things like that, looking at archaeology, listening to um, talks that were given and and lectures and things like this, and studying, reading articles, all this stuff. And over that two-year period, studying this out over and over again, I discovered something. I discovered that that the Bible is true. I discovered that it was it was not only reliable and true, but it's the most reliable ancient book that we have. And that nothing else even comes close to the reliability and the truthfulness of the Bible. And so what I'm going to do today is kind of a little bit more of a teaching, less of a sermon, and we're going to go into where did the Bible come from? And we're going to go through this. Now, there's no way that I could delineate all the information I learned over two years to you in 30 minutes. But what I hope to do is just kind of give you a little bit of an appetite for it, right? And give you kind of some foundational truths to kind of build off of and hope to kind of dive deep. Now, if you were part of our, it's been like a year and a half ago now when we did a kind of Bible study series called How to Understand the Bible. This was part of that. It's kind of how we started the series. So some of it hopefully will be familiar. I threw in some extra stuff too, but hopefully this kind of gives you an idea of how we got our Bible and why it's reliable. So the first question that we're going to answer is what is the Bible? All right. Again, there's a lot of assumptions out there. What is the Bible? That's just some book, an old book. So this is what the Bible is. First, the Bible is a collection actually of 66 books. So it's not just one book in of itself. It's actually a collection of 66 books that have been brought together to form the Bible. There's two major sections. You have the Old Testament, and this is everything before Jesus lived or on earth. And then you have the New Testament, and this starts at the birth of Christ and goes forward. It was written down by 40 different men on three different continents in three different languages over 1,500 years. So 40 men, three continents, three languages, and 1500 years yet even though all of those different people many of whom did not ever meet each other many of whom by the way didn't even read each other's writings some of the the prophets were contemporaries of each other and didn't even get to read each other's stuff and yet 
when we see the Bible all come together, we see that it is truly just one story. And that points to one author, God. So again, when you bring the Bible together, you see that from Genesis all the way to Revelation, it's one continual story. And they all intermingles and has to do with each other and all is connected in different ways. But these guys that wrote it down, these 40 different men that lived on three different continents during 1500 years, they're all writing at separate times in different places, some in different languages. And yet somehow it all became one story. Now imagine it's like this. Imagine that I sit down and I decide to write the first five chapters of a 10 chapter book. So I sit down at my computer, I write out this manuscript, I print it off, and then I bury it in the ground, okay? Then imagine 500 years later, okay, someone else comes along and decides in their own head, you know what, I'm going to write the five, I'm going to write the last five chapters of a book. And they get down, they write out five chapters, the last five chapters, they never saw my first five, yet they go, they write it out, they bury it in the ground. Then imagine a thousand years later, someone comes along, they pick up these two manuscripts off the ground, and those two stories match perfectly, right? Now, the unlikeliness of that happening, it just would be impossible for that to happen, but that's exactly what happened with the Bible. All these men that wrote at different times, many of them, many of them didn't see their writings, and yet it all makes sense together. And that points that there's one God that was overseeing and authoring the entire thing. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.21, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. That means it wasn't just ten guys deciding they wanted to write something down. But it came from God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God is the author of the Bible. And throughout history, he spoke to different people to write down his words. And that's why we have the scripture today. No, so that's the Bible, but there's also, the Bible has different literary structures. Here's something important to remember about the Bible. Not all of it should be read in the same way. You have narrative stories, you have histories, you have letters, you have poetry, you have satire, you have prophecy, you have all of these different literary kind of structures within the Bible. And a lot of times what people get into trouble is they'll try to read it all as if it's just prose, as if it's just someone telling you what to do. But sometimes it's poetry, and it doesn't make sense to read it in the absolute literal sense. It's trying to give you a bigger picture of something. I know a lot of times when people mock or make fun of the Bible or point out inconsistencies or things like that, this is usually what's happening is they're not reading it according to its historical context or according to its literary structure. It also has different characters, different people that we see throughout the Bible. Some of them are good. Some of them are good. They're, they're people that we could follow after their example. Some are not so good. Some are absolutely evil, right? Not every single character in the Bible is someone that we model our life after. In fact, it kind of speaks to the, speaks to the, legitimacy, the legitimacy of the Bible, the fact that we see so many characters, so many people in the Bible that are flawed in many different ways, right? If you were going to sit down and write a story about your life and, and trying to influence other people, you wouldn't say all the bad, you wouldn't air your dirty laundry, right, out in front of everybody. But these guys did, and that's because the Lord was leading them, and they were showing that they are true, true humans that mess up just like us. So you have these different characters in the Bible as well. But most importantly, the Bible is a story of how God has worked in the lives of the mankind. It's a guidebook for our lives meant to be followed, and it's the primary way in which God speaks to us, and his word is alive and true. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is quick. And powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What that means is the Bible knows us better than we know ourselves. It's able to communicate to us and point out things in our own lives that we can't see, that we refuse to see, and it's able to teach us and shape us and remake us. And that's again because it came straight from God as He authored it. But here's, here's another question. So that's what the Bible is, but where did the Bible come from? Okay, that's that question that my friend Ryan asked me. How do you know that? How do you know these things? So to explain that, first I want to talk to you guys about the doctrine of preservation. So there's, in the scriptures, we read about how God preserves his word. And this is called the doctrine of preservation, meaning God is always, always going to take care of his word. God never lets his word fade or disappear or, or just change over time. Whatever, God is going to preserve it. Jesus Christ himself said that, 
that heaven and earth is going to pass away, but there's not going to be one jot or one tittle. These are like the tiniest little um, symbols in the Hebrew language that's going to pass away. It's like saying that there's not a period or a colon that's going to pass away. God is going to preserve his word. However, there's something weird that happens here, and this is kind of where we get in trouble with our own minds and our own kind of overcoming in our own hearts and minds. So remember this, this verse. The Bible is from God, but he used mankind to deliver it. So what that means is this. If you get men involved, okay, mankind involved, people involved, you're always going to get messiness involved, right? So it's not like this um, perfect system. It's not like we have the Ten Commandments written in stone and scroll like we can go to Washington, D.C. in the monument section. And there's all the Bible that God personally wrote down with his own hand. It's a little bit messy, and throughout time, mankind has kind of gotten involved, but this is where you got to have the faith, and we see that God, even in spite of all mankind's flaws and mistakes and mess-ups, God has still preserved his word. He's more powerful than even the mistakes of mankind, and he's able to preserve his word in spite of people messing up. So he used people to write it down. He even used their own personalities a lot of times come forth in the scriptures themselves. He used the personality of the person to communicate his truth. And we're going to start here, before we get into some other things, I'm going to start here. The fact that is this. The Bible itself is a miracle. There's no other way around it it's to, but to say that it is supernatural and it is a miracle. You have to have start from the place of faith. Jesus Christ has said that God's word is truth in John 17, 17. And you have to have the faith that God preserved his word, that he did what he said he was going to do, that he is powerful enough to overshadow and carry his word throughout history. You have to have that faith. However, God doesn't give us a blind faith. A lot of times in other religions around the world or worldwide religions, They'll tell you to do stuff or say things about history that are just simply not true. But the cool thing about God and about Christianity is God is not expecting us to have a total blind faith, saying, hey, here's what happened, and I'm going to give you absolutely no earthly evidence to back it up. But God over and over and over again gives us even earthly evidences that point to the proofs of what he's already done. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump into... A couple things here. We're going to look at some historical facts, and we're going to look at some manuscript evidence. And these are, again, you've got to have the faith in the Word of God, but also God, again, doesn't give us that blind faith. So we're going to start off with some historical facts, okay? These are just a few. I could spend the next two months every single day teaching through all the historical evidence, the archaeological evidences that we have for the Bible's validity, validity and truth. But I just picked four here. They're not in really any random order. They're just, I mean, they're just in random order. They're not really, um, they're not particular to anything in particular. They're just four random ones that I chose. They are, some of them have been recently found. So some of them are, are newer discoveries. But I'm just going to go through these and just kind of point to the truth of the Bible. So the first is this bula. Now this, uh, this is known as a, a bula. And what it is, is it's a seal. Right. So you have ever seen like an old movie or something and and like George Washington is writing a letter and he seals it with wax or whatever. Right. Like that's what this is. But in the in this time, the ancient times, a lot of times instead of wax, they would use clay and then they would press their insignia, their ring, their necklace, their stamp into that clay once they finished a scroll. Now, here's what's unique about this in, this one in particular. And they were just doing some um, excavations. They found it on the ground, cleaned it off, read it, and they were pretty amazed. So in Jeremiah chapter 36, here's what happens. Jeremiah is a prophet of God. God speaks to Jeremiah and tells Jeremiah, hey, write down my words and go and deliver it to this king. So Jeremiah writes down the words of God. He Actually, what Jeremiah does is he calls his scribe. His scribe is named Baruch. So Baruch comes and he's like, hey, God, give me these words. Write this down. And so he dictates it. Baruch writes it down in a scroll. They go and deliver it to the king. The king takes it, and he throws it straight into the fire. So, boom, right? Burns up, okay? There's God's word, mankind trying to destroy God's word. So, God comes back to Jeremiah and says, hey, king burned it up, write it down again. And so, Baruch gets out his quill, starts writing it all down on the scroll, and writes down this passage in Jeremiah. Now, again, had no historical proof that Baruch even existed, but then they found this. And this, what the writing is, it signifies that it is that Baruch, that was Jeremiah's scribe 
that was writing down these things. And so this is the seal that he would put, not necessarily on that scroll, but a seal that he would put on the scrolls as he's writing them down. Right? So again, it just points to the proof of the scriptures. Here's another one. This one is called the Tel Dan inscription. The Tel Dan inscription. For a long time, um, archaeologists and a lot of people doubted the existence of David, David, King David. We didn't have a lot of archaeological evidence for King David or for his rule. But lo and behold, now we do. We have a lot more now. But lo and behold, they're digging again, doing some excavations, and they find this, which is called the Tel Dan inscription. And the writing on there signifies the house of David, signifying this king or this kingly line of David. It points to the validity of who he was. Also, what's interesting is they found it in a certain ash layer, and they were able to date the time of the, the writing of this inscription to around the time that David lived. And so, again, it just pointed to the fact that David was a real person, that he did have a real lineage that carried on. There's another one. This one is uh, Solomon's Gates. Solomon's Gates. Solomon was another one that they thought for a while did not have any great proof. In 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 15, what we see is Solomon gives this command. And he gives a command to start kind of fortifying some of their cities that were not as well protected. And so he gives this command to do it. In particular, he gives them a command to build these special gates across these different cities. Again, these were lost to history until they had done many excavations. They looked at the Bible, looked at this, and they said, well, if these are the places, we might as well go and check it out. And they found these different gates, one of Gezer, Megiddo, and Hazor, all the same type of gate there that entrance into the city. Again, these, are known, these were Solomon's command to build these gates. Again, proving the scripture. Here's the last one, Hezekiah's Tunnel. Hezekiah um, was king in Israel, and in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 20 and 2 Chronicles 32, 1 through 4, well, there's this time when the Assyrian army was coming, and at this time, cities that were bigger, they had walls around their city. That was to protect them from people just coming in and attacking. Now, there's a problem, though. The problem was that sometimes a, a, an opposing force would come around, surround the city, and put the city under a siege, which means that no one could come in and out of the city to get supplies. And they would just kind of do a waiting game. So they lost all their food, lost all their water, and the people inside would die or surrender. And so to protect against the Syrian siege that he was sure to come, King Hezekiah decided, hey, we're going to need water in this city. And so he instructed people to dig a tunnel underneath Jerusalem so that that would provide water from a spring throughout the city. Now, this, again, was lost to history for many, many years. In the late 1800s, they discovered this tunnel. And even if you go down into the tunnel, there's even an inscription that is written in and etched in, uh, in the wall. Again, this speaks to the validity of the scriptures. And it's important to note that the Bible has never been proven wrong. Right? It's never been proven wrong. It's never like we found archaeological evidence and said, oh, the Bible's completely wrong now because we found this. It never has happened. There's a lot of people that doubt things that happened. There's a lot of pe things that have not been found yet, right? Just because something says it happened and it hasn't been found, you can't prove that it hasn't happened. Just And that's been disproved multiple times. We found things that have proven the Bible to be true again and again and again. Hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of, of uh, evidences of hundreds of digs have been based upon the evidence that we find in the Bible. It points to the truth of what the scriptures are teaching, the historicity of it. The next thing we're going to look at is the manuscript evidence, the manuscript evidence. So this is more, how did we get the Bible we have today? Okay, how did that happen? They didn't have copy machines. They didn't have PDFs. How did we get the Bible that we have today? And here's, here's what's um, um, kind of interesting. We're going to look at two different things. We're going to look at the Old Testament, how we got that. And then we're going to look at the New Testament and how we got the New Testament. And we'll look at both of them a little bit separately because it kind of happened a little bit differently. So first let's look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament, what would happen is like, again, Jeremiah, right? Would sit down, write the words of God out on a, on a scroll. This scroll would be passed down. And what would happen is there was these scribes. Scribes, these were people that were employed by the temple courts there. And they would meticulously make copies. They would copy it word by word over and over and over again. 
Now, they were so strict about this process of making these copies that if they found a mistake in one, they would just take the scroll and burn it because they didn't want any mistakes to happen. And so that's kind of how we got the Old Testament. These scribes, over time, meticulously copying every word down, rechecking it, checking it again and again and again. Now, there's something that happened, though, with the Old Testament. A lot of the early copies had been lost. So a lot of the early copies, these early manuscripts, have been lost to history. So the earliest copy that we had of an Old Testament document was around the thousands A.D., okay? What that means is this is the earliest copy of the Old Testament that we had for many years was um, came after, was copied down after the life of Jesus. So skeptics would come along and say, well, of course Jesus fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy. The Old Testament wasn't even written until after Jesus lived on the earth, right? So that was their theory. So for years and years, we had to deal with that. People being skeptics, saying the Old Testament wasn't written until after Jesus' time. And then something incredible happened. In the late um, 1940s, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this has been heralded as probably, if not the greatest one of the top five greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. And here's why. Just to kind of tell you in a very quick version, Shepherd's walking along, throws a rock into a cave, hears some crackling, goes in, grabs some manuscripts, sells them at a, they go to sell them in a um, kind of marketplace. Someone that walks along that knows what he's looking at, notices them, gets them to show them where they're at, and they discover in these caves are hundreds and hundreds of these scrolls. And in these caves... We find these scrolls with um, with every single book of the Old Testament is contained in there, except for Esther for some reason. No one knows why that. But um, every other book of the Old Testament is found in these caves. And here's what's really cool. You look it up. You look at it, and this is just kind of one. You can see they're pretty well preserved for being well over 2,000 years old. Um, but we look at that. We read the words there. We look at the Bible that we have today, we look at the Old Testament, and we see that it matches up, okay? There wasn't as many people theorize tons of changes or parts completely left out, things like this. It matches what we have today. And what's what's in, even more incredible about it is that the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written hundreds of years before Jesus ever was born. Again, proving the fact that all of those prophecies about Jesus' life were written or the Messiah to come, were written before Jesus ever entered the earth. And so, again, God preserves his word. He keeps it true. Now let's look at the New Testament. The New Testament was a little bit different. How we got it wasn't the same. This is a verse uh, uh, that kind of explains a little bit how we got the New Testament. So Colossians 4.16, this is what Paul says. Paul's writing a letter to the church in Colossians. He says, and when this epistle, which is a letter, is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle or the letter from Laodicea. So here's what happened. Paul, Paul wrote many letters, but some of them were from the Holy Spirit. Some of them were from God. And so what he would do is he would write these letters. He would send it to these churches, and he commanded them, hey, when you read this letter, read it, and then go give it to another church so that they can read it. So here he's writing to the Colossian church. He says, read this among you and then give it to the Laodiceans so that they can read it. You get the letter from Laodicea and you read it. So here's what would happen. Church service. They come in. The church in Colossae would come in. They're like, hey guys, we got a letter from Paul. Awesome. So they open it up. They start reading it. He's like, okay, he wants us to do these things and he wants us to send it on to Laodicea. And they're like, whoa, whoa, hold up. Let's copy it down first. Right? So people started making copies in that church, which means this. They were not professional scribes. Okay, So it means there's a lot of mistakes in there. It also means that it's written on any type of material you can think of. There's even manuscripts that we have that on one side is scripture. On the other side was like someone's grocery list or something. right? <laughs> because they just grabbed whatever, script, whatever paper they had and started making copies. Now, is that a bad thing? Is that a bad thing that untrained people... We're writing down these manuscripts, and it made more mistakes. Is that a bad thing? The answer to that is no. And here's why this is a good thing, okay? Whenever you are trying to identify an ancient manuscript, you're going through a science called textual criticism. Textual criticism. 
And there's a lot of different factors that you look through, and we don't have time to go through all those, but I'll just name two of the factors and two of the major ones. Whenever they're looking at an ancient manuscript, and they're trying to determine the validity of this manuscript, is this manuscript actually true? Is it, um, is it, can it be actually connected to the person who wrote it, etc.? There's two major factors that they look at. One is time between the original and the copy. So we do not have any of the originals of the, of the New Testament or of the Old Testament. No original manuscripts. What we have is a lot of copies. And so what you're looking for is you're looking for, hey, has, how much time has happened between when it was supposedly written and the first copy, the first manuscript copy that we have? Less time in between those, that means less time for it to become distorted. Also what it can mean, if you write it quick enough, sometimes the copies could be produced when the original writer was still alive or somebody that they discipled or knew them well was still alive, right? And so you kind of want to look for how, how far apart by, time, by the original and to the copy. The second thing you're going to look for is the number of copies. The reason you want a lot of different copies of manuscripts is because that allows you to compare and contrast. If you just have one manuscript and that's all you have, you have no way to compare it with anything else. The more you have, the more able you're, the more that you're able to actually compare and contrast. So this is how it works, okay? Give you an illustration. Okay, say that I'm standing up here right now and I picked 20 of you from the crowd and I said, okay, you guys, um, here's my grocery list. I want you to write it down. And so I go through milk, eggs, cheese, bread, et cetera, et cetera. And then 20 of you guys are listening to what I'm saying and you're writing it down, okay? Now, right after that, I die, okay? So I'm gone and you have no evidence of, wait, what did he say? Now, of the 20 of you, some of you might have put eggs and some of you might not have. So how would we find out if what I originally said was eggs? Well, we go and we compare and contrast those 20 grocery list that you guys copy down. If 18 of you are saying, yes, he said eggs, and two of you are saying no, it's very realistic to assume 18 people did not just create eggs in their own mind, right? So um, the more copies that you have, the more you're able to actually compare and contrast. That's a good thing. So here's, so when the, uh, when the New Testament was written, they'd get these letters, they'd write it down, and even though they made mistakes, you have literal hundreds and hundreds of copies of these manuscripts to compare and contrast. So I'm going to just kind of show you just a couple tables here that compare the biblical reliability to other historical ancient documents that are taught all the time in college. So let's look at a, a few guys. So here on the screen, you, you have Plato, Aristotle, and Homer. All of these guys, their, their writings, their works are taught, taught in, as history in colleges, in universities, in, in high schools across the country. So Plato, let's look at him. So his right, he lived, in, or date written was around 347 BC. The earliest copy that we have of Plato's writings does not come until AD 900. That's 1,200 years between when he supposedly wrote the first one and the earliest copy that we have. That gives a lot of time for a lot of things to get changed or mistakes to be made or things to be done. The number of copies that we have, we only have seven copies. Again, that's not a lot to compare and contrast. Okay, so let's look at Aristotle. Aristotle, 322 BC, the first copy that we have of a manuscript that is from AD 1100. This is 1400 years after he wrote his, his writings. And we only have 49 copies. So a little bit more copies, a little more compare and contrast, but that's a long time span again. Now let's look at Homer. Now Homer has, his Iliad, is the best attested ancient document that we have. Of all ancient documents that we have, Homer is number one, except for another thing I'm going to mention in a second. All right, but Homer is number one, which I guess you can get. So he wrote it 900 BC. 400 BC, we have the earliest copy. That means it's only a time span of 500 years between his original writing and the writing that we have. Okay, so not that long. Still a very long time, though. This is double the age of the United States, right? So uh, 500 years, but we have 643 copies of his writing. What that gives us is this. It gives us, according to textual critics, gives us a 95% rating 
that what he actually wrote was true, that it actually came from a guy named Homer, that what he wrote about the Trojan War, all that stuff, was true. Now, here's the thing. This is a big number. It's 500 years between when he wrote his original copy and the first copy of manuscript that we have, and only 643 manuscripts. So, the next one I'm going to show you is of the New Testament. What would you guess how many manuscripts of the New Testament that we have? You don't have to say it out loud, but just want you to think of a number, okay? And I'll show you right now. This is the New Testament. The New Testament was written around 80, uh, 80, 50 to 100. The earliest manuscript we have is less than 100 years from the time of writing. What that means is, like, take P52, which is a manuscript of John. It was written within 60 years when, of John actually writing down the book of John, which means two things. One, this copy existed possibly during the lifetime of John, or at least his disciples. So that's pretty incredible. Next number of copies we have is over 5,600. 5,600. And that does not include all the other languages that the Bible was very early on copied to as well. These are just like the Greek manuscripts that we have. So we have less than 100 years from the, the original writing to the copy that we have, and 5,600 which gives us so much to compare and contrast, right? So if you're reading through this and you see that 5,400 of them all say the same thing, you can bet that that's what it's supposed to say, right? So even though those people that were writing it down, they were not professional scribes, they were doing us a great service because we have so, so many copies to choose from. What this does is this. This means that the Bible itself is the best attested ancient book from history. There's nothing else that even can compare to what the truthfulness and the accuracy of what the Bible has. So that means if any other college, if they're going to put Homer up there and teach that as truth, then it is, they should definitely be te teaching the Bible as truth as well, just by all the copies that we have. This is, I want to show you just one of them. This is, uh, this is called P52. This is an uh, excerpt from the book of John. It's the earliest manuscript of the Bible that we have. Okay, and again, it's just a, a small portion of it. But I want to show you, it's really kind of unique about what this says. It's written on both sides, which again, Christianity, they were the ones that invented what we call the codex or the book as we see it, like a page that flips. The scrolls before that, they were like, hey, that's too many pages. We need like, you know, to make it simpler. <laughs> and so it's written on both sides. Okay, and so I'm going to show you the verses that this contains. One side is this, John 18, 31 through 32 says this, Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, that's Jesus, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, Then that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. So on one side, you have this proof, what Jesus had already said, had prophesied how he was going to die. And this is the scripture telling us how he was going to die. The next side is this. It's the same story, just a few verses down. It says, Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said to them, I find no fault at all. The other side of this manuscript is Jesus declaring that he is the truth. It's interesting that the very first manuscript that we have of the New Testament, on one side is proving that what Jesus was saying was true through prophecies that he's given. And on the other side is him declaring himself to be the truth. Now, how cool is it about, about that, that that is what it's declaring to us. That very first manuscript is about Jesus being the truth. What we find is this. The Bible is the most reliable and trustworthy document we have from ancient history. You, this, is, this is what's so interesting to me. You cannot make a claim, an honest claim that actually can back it up, that you could say, oh, I believe Plato wrote his stuff. I believe Aristotle. I believe Tertullian. I believe all these other guys. But the Bible, we can't believe it. It's impossible. Scientifically, the Bible is the most reliable and trustworthy document we have from ancient history. Which means we can trust it. 
Again, God wants us to put our faith in it, but he hasn't given us a blind faith. He's given us proofs to show what he says is true. Now, I'm going to do this in conclusion, just this final one, is how we got the English Bible. A lot of people ask this. Well, then how did it eventually get into English? Well, uh, what happened was the Catholic Church, they had translated it years ago into Latin, and that was the main Bible that existed at the time was a Latin version. Only problem is a lot of people weren't reading Latin. And so that meant only the priests really could tell you what the Word of God said. They didn't have it in their own common language. So a guy comes along in the 1500s named William Tyndale. He says, hey, I believe that people should have the Bible in their own language. And so he begins to translate the Bible from the original language, the Greek and the Hebrew, into, um, into English. And the Catholic Church ended up putting him to death for this and killing him because they thought he was doing something wrong, to kind of taking their power from him. But it was funny because on when he was being killed, he, he prays a simple prayer. He says, God, open the eyes of the king. And it was just a few years after his death that um, one of the most popular English versions, the King James Version, was kind of commissioned by King James of England. And it got spread around the world. And, and since that time, uh, Christians that have been dedicated to the Word of God have always tried to translate God's Word from the original languages into people's spoken tongues. So it's been translated again into thousands of different languages and dialects across the world so every single person can have the Word of God in their own language. And that work is still continuing today. There are many dialects, there are many languages that still do not have the word of God in their own language. And there's missionaries that go out, and there's different organizations that go out to these places, learn their languages, and then translate so that they can have a Bible in their own language. Dr. Vodibachum says this. He says, I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, which is key. They couldn't make claims if there was other people that saw the same thing. So they confirmed it. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings were divine rather than human in origin. It's a reliable historical document that we can trust. And it's the very word of God. You know, when you look at all of this, all of this history, when you look at all of these events that had to take place, when you look at 40 different authors, three different continents, three different languages, 1,500 years, and you look at all that that happened, there's only really one conclusion that you can come to of how did it all match up perfectly? How do we still have this thing despite so many different times throughout history, people trying to destroy it and burn it and get it gone? It's the only explanation you could come up with is because God preserved it himself. God had his hand over it the entire time. And through all the flaws of mankind, through all the wars that have happened, through all the lost history that's been out there, God has always preserved his word. And so when we look at God's word, we can say the same thing that Jesus Christ said. God's word is true. And we can count on it, and we can trust in it, and we can look at it as being what is real and what is true. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to open up to our questions. Lord God, we thank you that although you call us to have a childlike faith, you also give us reasons to have faith. That you're a reasonable God, Lord. That you've created us in your image and given us a mind that can think and can research and can see. And Lord, that with that same mind, you gave us evidences. That you gave us things that help point us to you again and again. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Your word is so, so powerful. Lord God, and a lot of times we take it and we put it on a shelf and we forget about it. Lord, help us to take that book that you've preserved for the masses throughout history and help us to read it, help us to study it, and help us to live it out, Lord, as you would have us do. Lord, we thank you for your word, and I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, um, I know that was a lot of information. But we have a little bit of time here, and so I just wondered if there's any questions, any questions that you guys that you guys have. Yes. How do you spell that last guy's name? Vodi Oh, okay. It's V O D D I E V O D D I E, and then Bakum. B A U C H A M. By the way, 
I will email anybody that wants these notes, I'll email them to you. So all you gotta do uh, in your handout bulletin, there's my emails in there, or it's jakew at branchessf.com, and I'll email all the notes to you as well. So if you if you want those, you can have them. All right, any other questions? Has it been written for uh, blind people? Blind, yeah, Braille, yep, yep, Bible and Braille. Mm -hmm. No, there's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You very, you, like, pretty much never find a complete uh, manuscript. You know, it's bits, bits and pieces that they collect together. Yeah, and so that would include for all the other ones as well, the other things that we mentioned. Yes. Yeah, it's like, it's like no, um, earlier, earlier than that. Yeah, yeah. The 1500s was the the English one is when the English started coming out. Um, with William Tyndale. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was in Latin. So you had Latin, and then you also had uh, Greek versions that had been put together as well before that. Well, the Greeks were actually spread out. That was kind of a, that's a very long story. But um, the Latin ones, you had Latin Bibles, but you also had Coptic, you had Syriac, you had other languages had already been translated before then as well. So, yeah. How do you feel about the books that were removed from the Bible? So you're talking about like the Gnostic Gospels, like Gospel of Thomas or, or these other ones. So again, those all fall outside of this purview. So all the evidence I gave you for those, those are lacking on all of that kind of evidence, right? Which is why we dropped it. Yes, and it was never included in the Bible anyway. It was not like, like a lot of people will say during the Council of Nicaea, this happened like I think 500 AD or something, that that was when they got together and they manipulated the Bible and took out parts they didn't have, right? And you can see this even in popular television shows. Like, I mentioned Gilmore Girls a couple weeks ago. Um, there's this episode in Gilmore Girls where they're, they're going to the coffee shop, and these guys are talking about the Council of Nicaea and how they remove books for the Bible. I was like, what in the world? What is this doing in the show? But that's a popular thing, but it's an absolute myth. If you actually look at the you – you can actually go to the written documents of everything that happened during the Council of Nicaea, and at no point did they come up and say, we need to remove these things out of the Bible. And it was really – they were just confirming the canon of Scripture, meaning the 66 books that we consider to be all. It was just a confirmation of that, saying, hey, this is this is the Scripture, and it's something that they, the church had been using for years and years before that. Uh, okay, let's go with Marshall, since you haven't asked yet. Season 2, episode 7. Oh, no. Were you here during that, sir, or were you guys still traveling? Oh, okay, good. It was a joke. It was Yes. <laughs> yes, Aga? Uh, how, uh, who put this t together? Like, all these findings, how these books were found? Key Everyone. Like, so, like, right now... As, I don't know. That's okay. So, okay, so... Well, I mean, okay. There's two two things, though. One, I was kind of mentioning the kind of history of, like, the Greek manuscripts and how they came. And there's kind of two sections of that. I will not go into that. That will take like forever. <laughs> but um but as far as like the historical findings, the documents and things like that, is that what you're talking about like who found this manuscript and then how who brought this other one together like that? Mm, well, no, it's more about like who put together like the Bible by itself. Like all these in books that if they were written in different times and then who was in charge of saying now Oh, okay, yeah. That Okay, that there's no answer to that. That's kind of like as as the the books came out, the church as a whole recognized, hey, this is scripture from God. Um, that was happening really early on, though, because even in the Bible, Peter even remark makes a remark about Paul's writing. He says some of the scriptures are hard to understand, like like Paul's scriptures that he's written. And so even early days, Peter himself was recognizing the things that Paul was writing wasn't just Paul's own writings; it was from God. Right. And so um, it is kind of a collective effort of the church as a whole, like throughout history. And, and it's really God. That's the faith thing. God has just kind of kept kept it going. And, and the people they would recognize people within the churches would recognize, hey, this is scripture. This claims to be scripture and, and things like that. So that's <laughs> Oh, great. Don't ask me the question. Then. No, it's, 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 I don't know everything. <laughs> scripture, they, they quote, uh, like the extra Bible text. Yes. Like uh, Lilith and uh, I was thinking it was it the culture of the time that kind of like if you read like uh, Shakespeare and stuff like that. Yes. So yeah. So like the Bible quotes itself a lot, a whole lot. But um, there's certain times like in the Book of Jude, 
And even Paul himself, well, he referenced on Mars Hill, he referenced, he's like, hey, even your own, um, your own, uh, yes, yeah, so like, he, he mentions these different um, sayings, or your own poets, he even said your own poets mention these things. Book of Jude is actually one that um, quotes one of those extra canonical books. And yeah, it was because of the culture is what I would say is like it wasn't he wasn't claiming that that was scripture, just like Paul wasn't claiming that a Greek philosopher was scripture. It was just they were quoting something that was getting around and just like I quoted Gilmore Girls to make a point. Right. So, yeah, Uh, I had a sister and I liked it, too, I guess. All right. uh, George. Like, do miracles still happen today? Like, yes, ab- yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's still people getting healed. There's still, I mean, the simplest one is to say anybody, anytime anyone ever gets saved, anytime anyone accepts Jesus, that's a miracle, right? That's a miracle of a sinner that's far from God, and God drawing him to himself and saving that soul. That's a miracle in itself, and we don't think of it like that enough, but it is. And so, yeah, there's miracles that still happen. God's still at work. In, in big ways today and doing things all the time. And there's miracles that happen that we don't even know. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Know, we don't attribute them to a miracle until down the line we, yeah. we see through God's gift. Exactly, Holy yeah. Spirit oh, man, God is at work in ways, yeah, like we can't even understand. He's doing miracles all the time, all around us, every single day. and Sometimes we just can't see it. We have to hide. Okay, I'm actually going to have to stop. Okay, so I'm um, so sorry. If you have more questions... I'm here all week. No, um, <laughs> if you have more questions, though, you guys have my number, so feel free to text me, call me, or whatever. If you want to sit down and have a deeper conversation and kind of go into some more of this deeply, I encourage you to do that. But it is, it is incredible to see that God's word is just true, right? Not only scientifically, historically, just points to the truth of God's word, and God has preserved his word for us. And so it's important for us to say if God did all that work, to preserve his word, then how should we treat the word of God? We should, we should love it. We should, we should study it. We should live it out. We should take it because it is God's very word to us. He preserved it throughout history because he wanted you to have his words. Isn't that amazing? So take it. Study it. Read it. Let him speak to you through it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and invite, uh, we're not going to have our last song because I want to get make sure the great Hanway people can get out of here in time, but I want Sam and Maddie to come up here real quick. Um, for you guys that know, I'm going to skip through this. <laughs> All right, um, Sam and Maddie, uh, they are, this is their last Sunday with us. Wah, wah. Um, but they have been a huge blessing to our church. I know we already said a goodbye to them and then they had, obviously, Asa had his medical issues, and so they ended up staying here a month later. But um, one thing that we say at Branches all the time is, you know, we're not fancy, but we're family. And it's a very family-driven church that we care for each other, we love each other, we pray over each other. And so in this way, saying goodbye to Sam and Maddie, who have been here before the church ever started. They moved out here to help start the church and have been an integral and important and part of this whole thing, this journey, and, and we couldn't have done what we did without them and their help and their um, just friendship, but we are we are losing part of the family in that way. But I want to say this, Sam and I actually attended a, a conference this earlier part of this week, and they were talking about the conference, how a true measure of a church is not necessarily how many people you can add into the church. But he said, what, to be a truly biblical church, and you should measure how many people you're sending out. How many people you're sending out to the mission of God. If you look at the book of Acts, Antioch, they separated Paul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry. And what's incredible about Sam and Maddie is they felt called back to Ohio um, to do ministry there and maybe eventually pastor or, or start a church there. And so we just want to um, encourage them in that and pray over them now as, they, as we're sending them out to do the work of the Lord in another place. And so it's sad. We'll miss you guys. We love you guys for everything that you guys have done. Um, but we're going to go ahead and pray over you and make sure you say goodbye to them, give them a hug, things like that. Oh, this is from our church. Just thank you guys for everything. Um, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you, Lord, that at different times throughout our lives, you put people into place into our lives that just minister to our souls and to our minds, to our hearts. God, I thank you so much for doing that with Sam and Maddie, Lord, not only just 
allowing me to meet them, Lord, but also bringing them here to San Francisco and letting them have the impact that they did while they were here, the places that they worked here at Branches, Lord, helping to start this church. Lord, we pray that you bless their future ministry. We know that you're not done with them. We know that you're going to continue to work through them in great and mighty ways, Lord. I pray as they just look to the future and look to maybe planting or pastoring a church, Lord God, that you just help us as a church to be supportive of that, to pray over them, to help them in any way that we can. Lord, I pray that you would just allow them to be a light in their community, to reach more people for you, and to bring the hope of Jesus to people that need it so desperately. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, say your eyes to Sam and Maddie, and then um, if you're with the Great Hornway, make sure you hook up with Patty and go out there to start setting up, all right? All right, thank you guys so much. I love your shirt, by the way.